We truly do not know the cost of each one of us alabaster box. But Lord, what we do know is that you have poured out your heart to us. That you have shown us through Christ, Lord, what an amazing God you are. And it is today, Lord, that we kneel down, that we come to you and we pour out our hearts, we pour out everything to you. And we let the world know that as of this day, me and my house, I am going to serve the Lord. And Lord, as we are here, we're here to worship you. And we're here to pour out our hearts. We're here to cry out to the community, to cry out to you, to let you know how much we need you, how much we want you, how much we desire to have a relationship with you. I ask, Lord, that as you open, as we open this word, Lord, may we glean from it a message that is going to penetrate to the deepest part of our hearts, a message that is going to touch us in a way that, Lord, we will be transformed today. There's so much, Lord, that you want to tell us. There's so many things that are happening that you want to show us how soon you are. And, Lord, we need to be prepared And I ask that as we open this Bible, as we open the love letter that you have set for us, that we may put it into practice, that we may may understand that we are here for such a time as this. There might be others, Lord, that can do the work, but the work that you have set for us, only we can do. And I ask that you would empower us today that you would touch us today that you would heal us today that you would show us today that one individual it could be that one individual in our classroom it could be that neighbor it could be that one person that brought something to be fixed in my store lord may we understand that we ought to be complete representatives of you that when someone sees us may they see you we thank you in christ's name amen Today's sermon is called, Wake Up, because Christ is coming. You know, as you go through your day-to-day life, you can see more and more. You can see evidence of what's happening. But it's interesting because Lesvana, when she was reading the, the, the scripture reading today, and she was reading from the prodigal son, and you wondered, how is it that you're going to preach a sermon about individuals waking up, being that it is the prodigal son? And it's interesting because we have in the prodigal son story, and it starts in um, Luke chapter 15, and we're going to start with verse uh, 11. And it says, and he said, a certain man had two sons. So we start right away with a story of an individual that has two different distinct sons. And I think that by the time we finish the message today, you're going to understand the importance of us waking up, the importance of us understanding that God has a message for each one of us. God has an opportunity for each one of us to wake up and to be able to understand that it's important to know that he is soon to come. So we're here in the story of a, of a gentleman that has the two sons, and it continues, And the youngest of them said to his father, Father, give me the portions of good that falleth me, and he divided unto the living. You know, it's interesting when you go through your life. I know that some of you, you have maybe some wealth that you're going to pass on to your children, and usually the wealth goes to the eldest. Not all the time. It didn't happen to me, even though my father wasn't wealthy. My brother was the one that was in charge of of, uh, managing the money because he was the one that was closest and he was there in the area. And it's interesting to see because now you've got the youngest are coming in and he's saying, Dad, I love you, but I don't want to wait till you die. I want to have my wealth now. You know, when you look at at, uh, these aspects sometimes, um, you, you're wondering, how is it that happens? But as parents, we could see it. We could see that there is, especially when you have two, I've only been blessed with one uh, daughter, so it's not the same. But you can see that one is a little more rebellious than the other. 
you know, and at this time we look at, we look at here and it's saying the young man is coming and says, dad, I want my money and I want it now. You know, it's funny because as a father, you want to be able to say, uh, I don't think so. You know, so you look at this story and you're wondering, well, maybe that's what he's going to do. And it says, verse 13, and it says, And not many days after the young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. You know, as we're going through and we're looking at this story and we understand that there is this young man that is looking outside and is saying, you know, I really don't like what God what my father has brought to me. I want to, I see what's happening out there. I see that there's a life that needs to be lived. I see that being in the church, I'm so, uh, I'm, I'm kind of tied down and I don't like that. I don't like coming in, waking up on a Sabbath morning and, and going and, and having to be ready when there's so many other things that I want to do. Maybe I want to go out into my cabin. I want to go uh, tobogganing. I don't know what do we do in the cabins. I want to go hunting. I want to do so many things. But yet I have to come and be dragged into the church and it's so boring. I, I see my friends that are having so much fun and it says, I'm going to see what I can do. And now this young man gone and, and he got all of his wealth, all of the things. And then in a few short weeks, he has nothing. He has wasted all of his money. You know, it's interesting because we're only three verses into this story. We have a story of two individuals, and now all of a sudden you have a young man that have wasted everything within a few months, but you still have a life to live. You have a future to live. And the story goes in verse 14, And when he has spent all, there arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. You know, it's so ironic that most of the time when things are going well, we think that it's going to continue forever. How many of you have had to go through difficult times? How many of you have, have maybe your own businesses and your business is in the brink of, of just losing it all? You know, because you think, oh, if everything's going to be great, I can spend all of my money this year. I don't need to put any in reserve. And then all of a sudden, a bad year comes. And then you found yourself in a difficult situation. And this young man thought that life was going to be a party for the rest of his life. A lot of the times we think that our parents are restricting us. Our parents are not letting us go. Our parents are not allowing us to do things. And what our parents are trying to do is to teach us that life is not just a party today. Life is something that you have to live for all eternity. And how here we have this young man. And he has sitting in a place. Now I'm sure that when he was there, he was having the time of his life. He had all kinds of friends. He had all individuals coming and enjoying the wonderful time that they were having. But now he's finding himself where there is a need, there's a want. And we go into verse 15. And he went and joined himself to a crit criticism unto the country. And he sent him with his field to feed the swines. I don't know if you truly understand how demoralizing this verse is. Remember that this young man is a Christian. This young man is a Jew, is a, is a one that, that knows that the Bible clearly tells us that swine is not something that we ought to be consuming, something that we ought to be even touching, or something that we ought to be in the midst of. But a lot of times when you look at, well, a lot of times when you found yourself in a difficult situation, a lot of times when you are in a deep sleep, when you are not realizing what God is trying to do in your life, and you are just li living life, and you're going through, God sends you situations in which you are in an absolute desperation. So here is this young man that at his home, he is the man. There are people, servants that are saying, sir, that are respecting him. And now he's in a place where he is in a pig pen. I don't know about you if you see the irony of what's happening here. But it's a point where here's a young man that was dressed. You know, you can tell that he was, he come from money. He come from a, from a well-being. And he is full of energy. And he's got all to live. And now he's in a place where he's scrounding and he's feeding the pigs. It's the worst of all the jobs that a man could have. And I can imagine him sitting there. It says, verse 16, And he would faint 
have, and he would fain have filled his belly which was with the hunks of the swine to the deed, and no man gave unto him. So here he was, he thought that he had all of these friends, and he's sitting here and he's eating what the pigs eat. You know, a lot of the times I wonder, is that what we're doing in our life? Is that what we do every day? We're eating the scraps of, of the lowest because we're not willing to surrender. We're not willing. I know that there are many young people that left their homes and, and they're suffering in big cities because they're so ashamed. They don't want to come back to their home. They don't want to come back to their parents because they feel that they're going to, they, they're going to be ashamed of what they did. But let me tell you, this story, when it comes, you're looking at this young man and this young man is is in the place where he would never thought he would be. He's found himself in the midst of the swines. He's found himself in the midst of, of the total, total, total uh, destruction for him because there's no way out. And it says in verse 17, And when he came to himself, oh, listen to this, when he came to himself, the reason why this sermon is called Wake Up, is because there are so many of us that are still in that swine pit. There's so many of us that think that it's all right, that there's so many of us that it doesn't matter what, uh, you know, how far, how deep, how long we have gone without God, we're still here and we don't have the realization and they stay there for years and years. How many individuals, young people die every day? Because they are willing to stay and they're not willing to wake up and to ask for help. But here is the young man is saying, and when he came to himself, he said, how many higher servants of my fathers have been enough to and a spare and I uh, purring with hunger. Brothers and sisters, this is what we're going to want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about today because there, right now we're looking at we are at the final events in life. And individuals are still wanting to play in the pen. There's so many individuals, there's so many of our young people that think that the things of the world offers is so much greater than to be in a church. We look out there and, and the churches are empty because the young people, the individuals are finding so many other wonderful things that they'd rather do than to be in the church. But the wonderful thing about this story is the young man that had given, that he had thrown everything away, he woke up. He said, I don't know what I'm doing here. I don't understand. My dad has a farm. My dad, the servants are living much better than I do. Oh, brothers and sisters, we should be rejoicing about this verse. We should be rejoicing about this verse because there's a young man that has found that said in my father's house there are many things that I can do in my father's house. Even if I am a servant, I will be much better than I am today. How many of you parents would love for your children to come back and say to that realization? How many of you grandparents, how many of you have been praying for those, uh, those young people that have gone, that you see that they're in drugs, they're in so many other things, and you're saying, oh, my Lord, may they come back. Here's this young man. He has the revelation. He wakes up and he says, oh, I had it better at home. In verse 16, and he would faint have failed in his belly, in verse 17, and when he came to himself. Let me tell you something, young men and young women. God is going to be tugging at your heart all the time. He is going to make sure that even when you think that you're having a good time, he's going to make sure that even when you think that life is so much better outside the church, God is going to try to put a faint thing in your heart and let's hope that he never, let's hope that you never get to a situation where this young man is found. Let's hope that you never are in a situation where all have been gone. Let's hope that you're not in this situation where all has been lost. And you have to come and you have to remember the things that your parents have taught you. Let's hope that you don't go to a place where you're saying, oh my, I can't do anything. I'd much rather just fail. But he's coming, and he said, he says in verse 17, and when he came to himself, he said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough and spare, and I'm here in hunger. Verse 18, 
and I will arise and go to my Father. I want to talk to you today, young people. I want to tell you that your Heavenly Father will forgive anything that you've ever done. And I know that as a father, I know that if my daughter, whatever situation that she finds herself in, she will always be my daughter, no matter what. I know that there are certain parents out there that are looking at their parents. When I was in prison ministries, I saw young men and young women there that the life circumstances had thrown to them. And a lot of them, they would tell me their stories about how their family, they didn't love them. But let me tell you, even though your earthly family may not love you, there is a God that loves you. There is a God that is sitting there with his open arms and is saying, come, come home, I love you. But there's many of those young men and young women when they talk to me in the prison. They said, ever since I've been here, my mom and dad has come and visited me. They still do love me. And your parents love you. There are so many things that I want you to, tell, to know that it's time to wake up. It's time to come to the realization that whatever the enemy has gotten you to go to, wherever depths that you have gone to, God is trying to wake you up today and tell you, I'm coming. The signs are all over us. There are so many things, if you open Daniel and Revelation, that are happening. It's almost like a newspaper telling you, wake up. It's time for me to come and take you home. And right now, you need to come to that realization like this young man did. I will arise. God is telling you, arise today. Tomorrow may be too late. God is yearning. God is asking. God is pleading with you. God is trying to tell you, today I have a gift for you. Today I have eternal life. I have prepared a place for you that hasn't even entered into a mind of man. I want to tell you that I love you. But you need to come and you need to wake up. You need to bring the realization that I love you. And it says that I'll go to my father and will say to my father, I have sinned against heaven before thee. Brothers and sisters, that's probably one of the things that are so difficult for us to do. Asking forgiveness. I know that as a husband, sometimes, you know, I put my heart, my foot down and says, no, she's going to have to come and ask for forgiveness. She's the one. But a lot of times we need to realize that God is asking us today that we need to come. We need to understand the wretchedness that we're in. We need to understand the sickness that we have caused. We need to understand the sin that is in our lives, and we need to come and we need to ask for forgiveness. Oh, young man, today, let me tell you, if you're out there and you're feeling that, that there is no hope, there is hope. There's someone that loves you. You may believe that no one here on earth loves you, but your Heavenly Father does. And He has individuals in churches. He has individuals in places to let you know that you are loved. You don't have to stay where you're at. You don't have to stay in sin. You don't have to stay in, the, in, in a sickness. You can come to the Lord today, and God is waiting for you. In verse 19, this says, And I'm no more worthy of calling you my son, Make me as one of the heirs. You know, I remember back a while back, I was talking to my father. And uh, he, I was telling him all of the troubles and all of the trials that I was going through. And he told me, and he said, son, I need you to do me a favor. I want you to go in the backyard of your home. I want you to take a shovel, and I want you to open a hole in the backyard. And he says, I want you to kneel down and I want you to deposit all of your trials and all of your troubles and all of your circumstances and all of your things. I want you to deposit it there. Make sure that that hole is deep enough so they never come up and then cover it over. And let me tell you, that was the greatest advice that my father has ever given me because from that moment forward, I gave it all to the Lord. And the moment I gave it all to the Lord, I no longer worry. Does that mean I don't have trials? Oh, yes, I do, but I don't worry. Does that mean I don't have tribulation? Oh, yes, I do. Does that mean I'm not depressed? Oh, yes, I am. But I'm giving it all to the Lord because he will take care of it. And this is what this young man says. I'm not worthy. But let me tell you right now that you are worthy. Let me tell you right now that your creator God died on the cross for you. Right now, I want to tell you that it doesn't matter. You can reject him. You can say that he doesn't exist. He's still going to love you no matter what. This young man in verse 20 says, And he arose and came to his father. But, oh, I love buts. I love when there is a but in the Bible. Because it means that there is something great that's about to happen. 
He says he arose, but you know, it's interesting because we have so many pre-thoughts of what's going to happen in our life. We have all these thoughts that we're coming back and we're asking for forgiveness and we're willing to do whatever the worst. If we're willing to work in a pig's pen in someone else's home, I know I would be willing to work in a pig's pen in my own home. And God tells you, he's saying, I'm going to come back. And even if my father makes me into the lowest of lowest. But there's a but there. And it says there, when he was yet a great way away off. I want to talk a little bit about this. Because what I want you to understand that here's a father that was waiting for the son. And he would sit there day in and day out. And your heavenly father is waiting for you. And he's going to wait for you until your very last breath. You might think that you might not be worth it. You might think that you have humiliated the name of your family. You might think that no one's society cares about you. But there's a God that is waiting for you. And before you even come, he's going to run to you. He's saying, son, you are so important to me that I'm going to meet you wherever. You know, this is a busy man. This is a man that had a farm that he took care of it. But yet when his son was coming, he was ready. He was ready for him. And I'm telling you, young man and young woman, if you think that your parents are there, most of them are, might be looking for you right now. And you might be saying, no, it's not true. But I'm telling you, look out today and call your family and tell them and find out that your mother and your father are probably yearning and waiting for you with open arms. And it says, but when he went a greater way, his father saw him and had compassion and run and fell on his neck. And kissed him. The story goes on. That he prepared a great feast for his father. For his son. And God is preparing a great feast for you. You know it's one thing about when you're up here. The time just flies. And I was telling my wife about the sermon. I was telling her what I was going, what it was about. And how we need to wake up right now. And I'm telling you because the story started with how many sons? There were two sons. You see, and most of the time, we want to stop here, and this is great, this is wonderful. A son came home, and a son was loved, and a son found that his father cared for him. But there's still yet another son. You know, and my wife said, well, you may not want, your time will run out, you may not want to talk about that other son. But let me tell you, the other son is the most important aspect of this story. Because brothers and sisters, even though the young man had to go into a pig pen to find out that his father would love him, this other young man was there with his father all the time, but yet did not know his own father. This young man was asleep longer than his son. And the sad part is, is that this young man, it doesn't say in the Bible that he had a time in which he woke up. The Bible never tells us that he came to the realization that he too was lost. And many of us have come into this church. Many of us have been Christian all of our lives. Many of us believe that we are saved. Many of us think that we are doing the greatest thing. But we are asleep as anyone out there. Because we think that we have the truth, we don't have the relationship with our Father. And that's what I want to tell you today. The story is not about young, young man. Many want to talk about the prodigal son. But let me tell you right now, there are more second sons in the church today than they are prodigal sons. There are more individuals today that feel that they have, okay, that they come to church on Sabbath, that they return their tithe, that they do all of these great things, that they even come up here and preach and teach and sing, and they do all of these things, but they do not know their father. And I want to tell you today that God wants you to know him. I want to tell you today that God is calling for you. I want to tell you today that God is saying this enough. Today may be your last opportunity. But I want to talk to you that are in the church. If you are a prodigal son and you came back, glory be to the name of God. But if you are that second son, I want you to look in the mirror and to say, Lord, do I really know you? Lord, do I really have a relationship with you? Or am I just trying to please my earthly father? Let me talk to you young people. Your earthly father does not need you to please him to be here. Your earthly father wants you to fall in love with your heavenly father just as much as he's in love with him. 
Because if you, if he took all the time to bring you here, every Sabbath from the moment that you were a child, and then he ends up in heaven and you're not there, it would have been all or nothing. You may be going through things that you may be saying today, but Luis, you don't understand. You don't understand that I was born to be free. You don't understand I was born to do all these great things. And that's wonderful. You have it in this story. If you want to go to your father today, Father, I want to live my life. I want to go and enjoy. I want to go and see what this life is all about. But remember, you may not have this experience that the prodigal son came to. There's so many young people out there that are still in the depth of, of sadness and drugs and alcohol and so many things, and they have not come to the realization that they can go back to their fathers and mothers. But the one that hurts the most is the one, the parent, that did all that he could. He did all possible. He took them and put them in the right schools. He took them to every uh, event. He did everything possible, and yet he was lost within the church. I think as a parent, that would hurt the most. Because you're trying to do all of you can. You're trying to save, especially if you're a pastor, especially if you're somebody that has given the gospel, and yet you see that your own son, your own daughter is not there. Or you see them in the church, but they don't have the relationship with him. Wake up, because Christ is coming. And Christ may be coming for some of you today. Christ may be coming for some of you, and you have no idea. But right now, God is telling you, I want you in my life. I want you to fall in love with me, and you don't need to be in the pig's pen to wake up. But if you are in the church, if you are a member and you're coming, and, and maybe your father, maybe your parents are dragging you, they're just, and you're just so upset because, oh, I want to be somewhere else. I want to tell you that your parents are trying to give you the best gift that you'll ever have. You may not know it today. You may be saying, oh, Luis, you have no idea. you old. You have no clue what I'm going through, but I went through what you went through. I was a child once. You may not believe it, but I was. And I had to make my own decisions, too. And God is telling you, please don't wait to be a prodigal son. Give your heart to the Lord right now because he's calling you and he's telling you that he wants you in his life. Our loving Father, I want to pray, Lord, for our young people. I want to pray, Lord, that you would come to them. Lord, I want to pray for those who are like the prodigal son and have left the home and they're no longer part of this movement. Lord, I pray that you would find them, that you would put them, whatever situation, whatever it takes. Lord, if they need to be in the pig's pen, let it be. But help them come to the realization that they need you today, that they need to come home, even if it is to be a servant in their home. Lord, but I most want to pray for those who are in the church. There's so many of us, Lord, and I include myself, that we feel that we are doing the work, but all we're doing is just going through the motion. There's so many of our young people, Lord, that they don't want to be here, that they feel they're being drugged here. But all I ask that you would find a way to tug at their hearts, that you would find a way to let them know that, yes, today, today you need to come and you need to surrender your hearts to me because tomorrow may be too late. There might be a young individuals that are listening to me today. And they might be waiting, Lord, to be healed. They might be waiting, Lord, to stop the sin that they're committing. They might be waiting, Lord, to be a better person before they get baptized. Lord, there is no such better thing. The enemy is never going to give you that opportunity. You need to come to the Lord today. You need to be baptized today. You need to tell the world today that I no longer live for the world. I live for Christ. And I ask, Lord, that you would touch their hearts, that they would understand that there is no better day but today. And I thank you. I ask these things in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.